be on top of you. Yeah! That sounds like every country song I like. Except for that there's no country songs that I like. So it sounds like nothing I've ever heard before. <laughs> oh, you bastard. <laughs> Why do they call it that gets my goat? I mean, it's just stupid. You baby. <laughs> Welcome everybody to another round of torture. I mean, sorry, to another episode of That Gets My Goat. That's what we're doing here. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And uh depending on when I edit this. This is the first episode in months. <laughs> I guess we had stuff we wanted to talk about. I, 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 we wanted to make an announcement. We wanted to introduce a new character. What did you want to talk about? What? Uh, yeah, I thought we would uh, do some talking about uh, a, a recent experience that you had, and I vicariously had. Twins. <laughs> it was really neat. And, you know, I, I had grown up watching G.I. Joe, and so I wondered if one twin would feel what the other twin was experiencing. But then I just ended up doing it with both of them, the same thing, because, you know, I didn't want anybody to feel left out, at least of all me. Uh, I'd say, yeah, it was, it was, I recommend it heartily. We're not talking about twins, are we? You can't really pull something. that off, can you? Uh huh. Yeah, we, what we were going to talk about is uh, apparently Rich Outfield went uh, to a writerly conference. It was out of his, yeah, see, I kept referring to it as a symposium. But conference sounds, no, conference sounds boring as hell. What, I guess symposium, that's now that sounds like a, a freaking frolicking, fun-filled afternoon, I'm sure. <laughs> potato, potato. <laughs> conference to me sounds like, oh, okay, you know, I got to go for work to this conference. Uh-huh. And I gotta wear a name tag, and uh, there will be no twins there. <laughs> but symposium means you know there's gonna be slides and food and presentations and anyway, I you and I years and years ago had gone to this symposium. I'm not gonna say it was a conference. Oh, you know what? Maybe when we were used to go, it was a conference, <laughs> and it was about writing. It had a science fiction bent to it. But it was about it was a writers' conference, and I remember what I would get out of it every time I would go. I think I went three years in a row. Every panel or presentation I was in, I would think to myself, "I should be at home writing right now. That would be a, a, such a better use of my time." And so I hadn't gone in years. I, I, if I said how many years, I would begin to weep. It's been that long. But you and I went to a convention a couple of weeks ago, and they plugged it a little bit, not a, not a lot. In one panel, I think they mentioned it. Right? Yeah, they mentioned it one panel, and they were handing out flyers to it as you walked out the door. Apparently, that was enough, though, because it totally convinced you. No, it, that wasn't it at all. I was at work, and this woman came in. I almost said this girl came in. But she's a woman now. We knew her when she was a girl, and she said, Hey, I haven't seen you in a long time. Are you still writing? And I said, Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and she was like, oh, you know, you really should be writing. You you were the best writer. And, you know, I often imagined laying with you, but, uh, you know, I never had the courage to tell you. And, and I, I was like, what, what was that? I was a good writer. And she says, there's this this conference uh, next weekend. Are you going to go? And and I said, oh, I, I, I had heard about it, but I, I wasn't thinking I was going to go. And she's like, oh, you should go. I'm going to take my daughter who could have been your daughter? No, no, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to take my daughter to it, and she's she's super into writing. I'm really exciting. I excited about it. I go every year, and uh, immediately I texted you and I said, "Hey, did, did you want to go to this thing?" And to make a long story short, no. <laughs> but I got it into my head that I was going to go, and I went on there and looked at the schedule of panels and stuff, and it was just jam packed with panels about writing. With interesting topics, and it, when I say jam packed, there were five or six panels each hour, and two or three of the panels had interesting names to them or interesting topics, and some of it was you know people discussing a particular book or genre or topic, and one uh, some of them were people reading their papers like uh, 
is my master's thesis or whatever. Uh, and then there were just others where uh, it was instructional. How to blank with twins. And I thought, wow, this, this sounds really, really good. It was a three-day conference, and I had to work on the second day. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll go on the first day, and if I like it, then I'll come on the third day. You know, I'll, I'll buy another ticket. But I enjoyed the first day so much that I thought, shoot, I, I wish that I didn't have to go to work tomorrow so that I could go to this thing. Yeah, I think you texted me that night and said, you know, I know that you're too lame to call in sick. But if you called in sick, I would also call in sick and go with you to this thing. Yeah, I've never called in sick in all the time I've had my job. And uh, I thought that you would get as much out of the panels and the, uh, the discussion and just being around creative people as I did. And uh, in, in the spirit of uh, full disclosure, they weren't identical twins. No, I should mention that Renee Chambliss told me, no, you've got to go. You'll hate yourself if you don't go to this writer's conference. And so she kind of was the tipping point, the reason that I did go that first day. But like I was saying, being around creative people who are really passionate about writing and wanted to improve their craft or wanted to find, you know, shortcuts to being bestsellers and stuff like that was invigorating. And it was it made me excited. And and uh, you had said, you know, why don't you tape these panels since I'm stuck at work and, and too lame to come? And then I can listen to the recordings and it'll be as though I went, too. And I should have done that. <laughs> Hence just, the vicariousness I, yeah, let of you the... Down. The experience of the twins. I mean, the panels, sorry. Yeah, he, you taped uh, some of them. Anyway. You didn't tape the first day, but you taped the third day. You didn't go the second day. So the third day is what I heard, I'm assuming. Yeah, and I, I think you mentioned it at the end of the first day when I t told you you're lame. But <laughs> if you want to come tomorrow and not be lame, I will come tomorrow and not be lame too. And you said, well, no. But if you recorded them panels, then, you know, I could get something out of it. And so I meant to bring the recorder the second day. And, and you know, I, I couldn't really go, but there was one panel I really wanted to go to. And it was on the second day. And it was how to write a novel in 90 days. There were a lot of panels that were how to blank, like I said. But this one was like 90 days. You know, if, if that's possible, I got 90 days. You, know. you think, oh, okay. but actually I have plans for you that will, they'll come to fruition in less than 90 days. So, uh, so I <clears throat> ran over there Sorry. and I went to that panel and yeah, I wish that I had recorded it for you because that was the panel I think I got the most out of. He ran it as a, you know, a, like he's your teacher and if you're going to get a good grade in his class, this is what you have to do. And, but he, you know, he referred to himself as the boss. I am your boss and this is your job to write a novel in 90 days. And these are the steps that you're going to take. And this is what you're going to do. And there was nothing revolutionary that he said. It was all stuff we've heard before. You know, you have to write 1,666 words a day. And, and to me, I was just like, Wow, this guy is a fan of the beast like I am. You know, he said, "What? Uh, what is the significance of one thousand six hundred and sixty-six?" And I, and you know, I started to chant, and he's like, "No, uh, that's what's required for nano rimo." And everybody around me was like, e -e -e, "Nano rimo, praise him!" And I, uh, yeah, they're, they're that's, that's their a, dark god that they pray to. Yeah. I, I, I think we've discussed my disdain for the NaNoWriMo people, but we will again sometime. <laughs> but anyhow, he was like, I am your boss. And just this once, you're following my instructions, and you will do as your boss says. And this is what you have to do, and this is what you have to do. And he had a timeline of this is the first 30 days, and this is the fifth week or whatever, and this is where you're going to be and what you're going to do, and all that. And, and the way he laid it out, it sounded so doable, more doable than twins. It was just like, what? Well, I, I think I could do that. You know, one of the things that he had said was, we're going to split up, you know, the 90 days into segments. And the first segment is your planning segment, you know, 
This is when you do your research. This is when you write your step outline. This is when you sit down to figure out what the characters are and what their voices are going to be like and what their backgrounds are. And, you know, ask yourself all those questions that people always want you to do on character sheets. Figure out, you know, what your goals are, what your theme is going to be, you know, what the overarching narrative is going to say and all this. And, you know, and he was writing all this stuff down. It was a PowerPoint presentation. I guess I was writing all this stuff down, but he had it written down. He was just clicking the next he, button. He was clicking. But he, again, he, he, he did it in a way where I thought I, this is doable. Anybody in this room, not just me can do this if you know if if his plan works and he was saying you know you you've got a month where you're going to figure out where the story is going and I'm not saying that you have to not deviate from this plan but you're going to have a map where the story is going and any time that you get tempted to have writer's block or you get bored or you get distracted you're going to look at the map and say no my boss said I had to stick to this and I had to get to the end i have to do is you know like one of his rules during the writing segment of the the uh, schedule was no rewriting don't go back and redo the last chapter don't go back and fit oh this is their grammar was wrong here or, or fixing typos he said no all of that will come later right now you're just writing and he said you know i know a lot of you are going to ignore me They're, you're going to do it anyway he's like but you shouldn't be doing it this period right now is for writing Anyhow, he was he, he was really confident. The way that he presented it, I got a lot out of it and walked out of that and then went to work thinking, I could do this. I can write a novel. And, and we'd been kicking around this idea of that 2015 would be the year that I would write a novel. I, I've i never been able to write a novel before. And it, part of it is just, you know, fear. Oh, it just seems too big. Size matters not. Sadly. Uh, my experience with the twins. Grew. Judge me by my size, do you? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I, I vicariously lived through this panel by way of your notes. You sent me your notes out, which was a typed up page, maybe a page and a half. I don't know. I saw it on a phone, so that doesn't really give you a, a good idea of what a page is. But I found that really interesting, too. The, uh, the whole idea that you have three months to write your novel and one month of that entirely is just planning the novel out it's just devoted just to that because i feel like i should plan I, i'm not one of those you know they talk about the two different kinds of writers there's the pantsers who just fly by the seat of their pants they make it up as they go along and it works for them there are people that write like that you know stephen king has said that, you know, an outline is the worst thing you could ever do for a novel or whatever, which I d disagree with 100%. I mean, I like Stephen King, and I like a lot of his stuff, and I think he's great, but I could never make it through anything, probably, without somewhat of an outline to guide me. I don't know, maybe it's because of people like Stephen King, but I find that I feel quickly pressured to move beyond the planning stage. And I think Dean Wesley Smith talked a little bit about this. One of his sacred cows that he kills in his thing is, you know, the sacred cow of research. You have to research everything to the nth degree. Otherwise, your book might not seem totally genuine. But so many people use research as, you know, a, an excuse to never start writing. That he says, you know, you, you want to research, you can research, but you got to get on to writing at some point because research is not writing and your writing will not get better unless you're writing. So, yeah, for example, the book that I started writing uh, last year called Sunny and Gray, I've written two chapters is all I started doing up an outline for that and I quickly felt guilty that I wasn't writing. I thought, oh, I, I, maybe I should just start writing. I've got the first third of it outlined, maybe, and now I need to just get on to, with it, just get to it and write the thing, and I can keep filling in the outline as time goes by. Of course, I've done nothing more on the outline since then, and I've only written two chapters, so I don't know that that worked. But, uh, yeah, just the, the, the freedom of, hey, this whole month is just for planning, go. I don't know. That that seems kind of liberating to me. It makes me feel like, hey, I can do this. I can sit down and I could 
in a month's time, it seems like you could do a lot. You could have a really detailed outline, a really detailed, you know, bunch of character studies and all the kind of things that you would need before you start writing the novel. I know people that do NaNoWriMo, you know, they're always talking about how October and probably even before October, they're spending all their time getting their NaNoWriMo all ready to go. See, that offends my religious sensibilities. <laughs> October is his month. <laughs> the Beast doesn't want you dedicated. Yeah, to that's the that's the month you should be writing 1,666 <clears throat> words. You can even miss the first thousand if you'd like, guys. But, uh, yeah, the, the, he talked about certain things, and, and he made it seem easy. And that's an, another thing that was helpful. If you went to a panel and they talked about how hard it is to break into publishing. And we've all been to panels like that where, you know, when we, you and I were in film school, they would talk about, you know, look at, stand up and look at everybody else in this class. One of you may make it briefly in the film industry and the rest of you will fail miserably. Damn, they were right. Wait. That's not what we're and they would, about you know, here. they would, they would, and this would be in like the big classes. In the small classes, they'd be like, "You're all failures. You all suck." <laughs> and sometimes they would point to the door and say, "This is where you should go, really, if you want to be happy. Go, get out the door and leave. Don't pursue this." And those kind of things. The school of accounting is just across the quad. There you go. And uh, yeah, that that you'll hear panels about that. It's like if people want to get rich, they want to write the next Twilight or Fifty Shades of Grey or, or whatever it is. And they say, you know, there are so many easier ways of making money, so many easier ways of becoming rich than somehow magically writing the book that lights everybody's imagination on fire. And so for him to talk about like, hey, everybody in this room can do this. And he gave out his email address, and he said, you know, I want everybody in here to commit to this, and I want you to write a novel, and I want you to email me and let me know how it went. And, and if there were points that didn't work well for you, you know, maybe I'll revise them the next time I do this panel. But I just thought, I was like, wow, I could do this. And it was a positive hour. And I, I think uh, it is doable. I... I I keep thinking about, well, what will my novel be about? And what, what, what do I have in me that's novel-sized? And that has been really daunting. But uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention, though, that's totally related, though, is an aspect of the personality of the people who were on these panels, especially this guy, the guy that did the 90-day Yeah, panel. I know this guy because he did a panel at the other conference that we went to uh, the the other convention, I guess that one we're we're calling right. The conference is boring. A symposium is fun and has food. Uh, well, it's a, a symposium. You learn things. A convention has, is just you wear costumes and you get to you know. And a and a see co conference and is boring. Hell so, yes. <laughs> so we went to a convention, and uh, this guy did a few panels that we were in. So I know this guy that he's talking about. And yeah, he had a personality, that's for sure, or the aspect of the personality. So go on, Rich Outfield. Well, the uh, the panelists invariably would either have a mock-up of their book cover that they would put in front of them where their name tags were, their name placards were, or they would put up their actual published books there as illustrations of what they had done and as a reminder to plug their work during each of the panels. And uh, I went to enough panels that I saw the same faces a couple of different times, and they invariably would point out what their books were about and where they were available. And this guy, though, especially, he would talk up his books. And he would, he would let you know how good these books were and how worth your time the books were, how excellent examples of this his books were, and what kind of a favor you'd be doing yourself if you went out and bought those books. And I noticed that again and again. Part of it was informative, but part of it was these people want to plug their stuff. And so again and again, people would talk about, well, when I was writing my book, Asian Buffet, I uh, 
I found <laughs> that, you know, there was a really hard choice I had to make. And when I was and writing it was rice my book, or noodles, Office Depot. <laughs> Sorry, we're naming our books after the stores that are within view. Um, <laughs> but they would do that. And, you know, like in his, he was talking about, okay, you know, the 90 day. This is, I wrote this book, Down East Outlet, on <laughs> the 90 day schedule. You know, these are the things that I came up with. And here are, you know, a couple of instances from my notes. And if you want to go, you know, we're, there's a book, a vendor place where my book is available. And you'll love Down East Outlet if you read it. And I I, I, I admired that. I, I also resented it at the same time, in the same way that the popular kid at high school you admire and resent at the same time. That you would have that kind of confidence or maybe, is there an, another word? Pride in your, comp not pride, but sh some kind of showmanship of, you know, buy my stuff, make your life better by buying my book. And the ability to toot your own horn. Yeah. I can toot as my children who actually call farts toots very often can attest to. You know, it's weird. I never, ever once in my life called a fart a toot when I was actually a child but sadly that's something i've had to resort to as an adult which really sucks. because fart is a dirty word but toot is not uh, apparently i don't know i don't think it's bad i would say fart every time huh. or worse shart oh <laughs> but yeah i don't know i think that's something that my wife brought aboard the toot thing <laughs> Which I, I just hate it. I'm sorry. But that's not important. It's not what we're talking about. We're talking about tooting your own horn. Right. And this was something that as I went through all those panels, I thought... I, oh, and another thing. I thought I could be on some of these panels. Like, you and I, we went to... No, I don't think you and I went to a Spider-Man panel. Yeah, we did. Okay, I knew so much more about Spider-Man than these people on the panel. And I was like, why am I not up there? Because I could talk about just with passion how great this point about Spider-Man is or whatever. And, and, and we just both got free shirts from that. Slap panel. the guy that said that the, the Harry Osborn drug issues came after Gwen Stacy's death. I mean, come on. I wanted to be up there because I had things to say and I had knowledge base. And with like the writing or, you know, we, we've been on panels before, but, you know, if, if they were to do audio book panels at this convention next year, I would want to be on there. I would want to propose to them, I, hey, I'll, I'll do an audiobook panel and, you know, see if I can get Renee to fly down and stuff. And, but it occurred to me that if I were on those panels, though, I would have to be able to do that, to, to self-promote unabashedly, unashamedly, untimidly promote my stuff and say, hey, this is for sale and you would like it. And so I thought it would be neat to you introduce... You will it. like it. You will. You will, or else. Yes. What? Uh -huh. I thought it would be neat to introduce a new character, and, and we'll present him here today, and maybe he will show up on the Dune, Steve. But the new character is California Rish. Oh, okay. And if you don't know, if it, let's say you're Gino Moretto and you live far away, California is the greatest of all American states. And the people from California are better than everyone else. It's kind of like <laughs> the royal family in Wales. They're handsomer. They're 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 they're, they're just they're better. They 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 tend to have more money. They certainly dress better. They've got better skin. Their souls are better. Their souls are worth more if they sell them to the devil. And here, growing up in BFE. You would always find out if somebody came from California because they would preface every conversation with, I'm from California. And you've heard me say that before. It, it was shocking to have somebody say that in that tone of voice, especially when it was a man. But they have to do it because they're from the greatest state in the nation and they're better than you. And they would not want to be confused with somebody who's from Nevada or from Wisconsin, or f from Hawaii, or, or Guam, or Saskatoon, or Utah, or, you know, I think New York is the only ex uh, exception, because New Yorkers are just assholes, and they want you to know that. Um, <laughs> so, so here comes California Rish, who knows that he's better than you, and is going to remind you. 
And so when I was in that uh, panel, one of the things they were talking about was, what is your story about? What is your theme? And I'm currently writing a sequel to Birth of a Sidekick, which was a fantastic story that I wrote a number of years ago, and I podcasted myself. And it's out there on Amazon. I even did an audible audiobook of it. But it's just, it's to die for. You deserve to go out there and listen to it and buy it and get yourself off during. But I've been planning, because I'm just that decent a person, to do a sequel to help all the listeners that so loved and the new listeners that have yet to discover Birth of a Sidekick. And it had never occurred to me, which it should because I'm smart, what is the theme of this story that I'm writing? And I thought, well, I think the theme is family. A person that's on his own, a kid who has no family and he wants family. He needs to connect with somebody. So he finds someone that he can connect with in the first book and it doesn't work out so well. And then in the second book, he finds a new person and maybe this will work out. Maybe it won't. If it were you, well, he'd get molested and killed with a broken bottle at the end of the story. But because it's mine, maybe he'll, he'll have this family. Maybe he won't. And uh, I just really, I liked the idea of saying that's what the story is about, and it helped me figure out where I wanted to go with the story. There was one other thing at the panel that you and I went to. At the convention before, there was a writer who said, and, and I, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but he said, you've got to find out what your main character wants, and if they get that thing, then it's a short story. But if they keep finding things in their way, obstacles in their path to getting that thing, then you have a novel. And it, it's elementary, it's basic. It's something that any Californian should know. But I had, it hadn't occurred to me that maybe that's all you have to do to take something that's a short story and make it in a novelette or a novella or a novel is just keep putting obstacles in front of your main character's path. And so for Birth of a Sidekick sequel... I've come up with a bunch of, well, they're cruel and mean obstacles to put in the path of Ben Parks from getting what he wants. And it's made the story better. It's made the story easier and meaner. You'll like it. Yes. But I'm it, from California, so of course I would. I'm sorry. Say that Say that again. <laughs> what did you say? That? I'm from California. Yes, you are. So Wait, you shouldn't have to stand in line. You should just California be able to go accent. right there. Anyhow... I think it's made the story, which would have, have been, it would have been good anyway, because I'm writing it, but it, I think it's making it even better. And it plus, as we were saying with uh, charting out your, your book, it's giving me something to shoot for. You know, this is, this is where I want Ben to be at the end of the story, in tears, and I want the audience there too. So that's, that's, that's what I'm, I'm applying some of the things from that to a short story, although me writing it, you know it's not going to be short. But it is going to be good. <laughs> Sorry, I've become yeah, a different you, character. You and your accent. It's, uh, the name California Rish and the accent of California Rish don't really gel together for some reason. But So anyway, we'll say goodbye to California Rish, and I know you don't want me to leave. But too much of a good thing, it makes you fat like Big Anchor Rich. All right, I'll see All you All right, well, it's nice to meet you, California Rish. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, Anyhow, you know, don't be a stranger. Come, come on back uh, as often as you need to to help out BFE Rish to uh, get his confidence up. Some of the stuff that uh, you heard in some of those panels, uh, I, I want to say that the convention that we went to is when we first started, uh, when you were first introduced perhaps to the try fail cycle the obstacles in the way thing right right yeah you and i were in the same room i think when he said the short story versus a novel thing anyway i was able to go up to him afterward well california rish was and <laughs> tell him how much i'd gotten out of that comment that he had made and ask him for a short story but i don't know it's, it's helpful and if it works for the sequel that i'm frankly struggling through california rish wouldn't tell you that but i i'm struggling then I'm, I, I'll be able to apply these same principles to a, a novel. We just were talking about that before we started the show. I tossed out the idea that maybe what we should do this year is do this 90-day challenge that that uh, gentleman in the panel introduced to you. 
that got you so excited and kind of pumped up that we, you and I, following the exact same schedule, we say, okay, day one is this day. We start planning. Day one of writing is here. We write this much a day. You know, go through the whole thing together as kind of a challenge to see if we can actually succeed and do this and write the novel in 90 days. See, 90 is three times the amount that these NaNoWriMo people, for lack of a better word, do. <laughs> if they can write a whole novel, which is a book that you write in 30 days, in 30 days, then you and I could write a novel in 90, right? I think we could. I mean, when it comes down to it, the NaNoWriMo pace is what we have to write at, that 1,666 words. That is 31 days of November divided into 50,000 words. Oh, so 50,000 is what you have to have yeah, that's nano... by the 30th of November. There's only oh, 30. there's 30? Okay, that makes more sense because I thought 31, that's probably not going to come out to 1666. But yeah, 50,000 words is what you have to achieve to win NaNoWriMo. Wait, wait. There's a winning and a losing? Winning is getting to 50,000 words. Hmm. Losing is not. Basically is that. And you get like a little, you can get a certificate or something. You go and say, hey, I wrote 50,000. And it's like, well, here you go. And you can print it out and put it on your friggin' wall or something if you want to. I think you have to pledge to, you know, from the beginning, you have to go before the 1st of November and say, I'm going to write, sign up for it. And then at the end you say, yes, I won. And you'll get their thing. Yeah, they're not counting in the month of planning as part of that. But... The extra two weeks of 1,666 words, I assume, I don't know where that gets you to, but I'm guessing that's... Did, did he say? I can't remember if he said. Did yeah, he, say he, a said, word count? he said anything over, I think, 50,000 is a novel. But the sweet spot, as he called it, was 70 to 120,000 words. It's like, that's a big, that's a book, that's where you want to shoot for. You know, you you had mentioned reading Louis L'Amour books. How many words would you say something like that is? I don't know. They're so small. I would say 50,000 tops, probably. They seemed, oh gosh, they seemed like you could, you could eat the whole book in one sitting, much less read it. It was that thin. Yeah, I don't know how long they are, but yeah, we were talking about that since we were talking about Birth of a Sidekick and Westerns. Gosh, I don't know. I would say an audiobook of a Louis L'Amour would probably be four hours or less. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of classic science fiction novels that are the same kind of thing, where they're the, the big, fat tomes that people, especially with certain genres, like fantasy, for example, you had to have just this, this gigantic, freaking paperweight-sized thing, weighs more than a bar of gold or something. I don't know. <laughs> just these... these gigantic books you know that was something that seems to have come later you know as the years went by then books got bigger and fatter even well lord of the rings got published in three installments three volumes you know because the publisher said geez a 600 page book or however big lord of the rings was we can't do that and that was the 50s right so right and yeah that was the way it seemed to it used to have been so maybe that's just why Louis L'Amour books were always that size, but we talked about it, I think, already in a different episode that we did where we mentioned that convention, convention, sorry, I almost said conference again, the boring thing, but this was a convention we went to, and somebody mentioned commuter novels, which I guess these days that's the way to go again. Because you can charge the same, you know, you, you write a novel and you charge the same People won't allow you to charge like $40 for a gigantic book, but you are okay to charge $5 for something that's 10% of that size. So, you know, they're just like, you know, what you need to do is just write something that's this length. And I want to say fifty to 70000 is what they were saying. You know, these short books is the best way to go because then you can write a lot more of them and you can still charge a full novel price for it and you get paid the most that way so yeah i think dean wesley smith would agree with you there's a lot of people out there that say quantity is more important than quality 
It's better that you have three good books out there than one great book, because you sell three times as many. And, and when I hear myself say it, I can see people disagreeing. I don't think Dean Wesley Smith is saying that you or should half-ass this. But he's saying, if you want to make a living, if you want to make money, you've got to have more stuff out there. More for people to buy if they like anything. And I really want to follow that. I really want to do as he says. Birth of a Sidekick's not the first Western that I've written. And a little voice in the back of my head is saying, well, we'll put out the other stuff that you've written because if somebody liked Birth of a Sidekick, they'll like these other things and they're already written. Why not put them out, you know? Yeah. Um, it, you, it's, need it's to, just... you need to let California Rish back in when uh, when those ideas come up. Yeah, and, and just I... stand in front of the mirror and tell yourself why you should because it's so awesome and that these people will love themselves. The good thing is California Big is big because I'm from California. You so. are. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, uh, okay, Dean Wesley Smith's Thing. And I know that we invoke his name a lot, um, even more than I invoke the Beast. And I, I'm, I, I'll try and change that, guys. <laughs> but you're disappointing. He all those says listeners. things that, if he's right, <laughs> then we've got to follow him. You know what I mean? Like one of the things he says is, as soon as you finish that story, you you can send it out to you know magazines or whatever and start on the next story. But if you don't want to do the magazine thing in today's climate, in the 20 teens, just publish it yourself. I think he said charge no less than two ninety nine for your story. Yeah. Put it out there and start on the next one. Don't polish it and rewrite it and try and make it great. He does fix say to the fix next the typos. One. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> and he doesn't say... Put it out there, you know, aside, uh, nobody has looked at it. You never looked at it again. But he's like, as soon as it's done, and I, I think he had a blog about rewrites and what you should look for in rewrites or whatever. But as soon as that one pass is done, put it out there so people can buy it. And if you've got a lot of things out there, then you don't have to put all your eggs just hoping that one of those books sells. You can sell three copies of this and five copies of that and seven copies of this. And the checks will start to come in. And I've, well, let's get California Rich to say this because it'll sound assholey if I say it. I've found with my audiobooks that that started to be true already. Now, granted, I don't make a lot of money from my audiobooks, but if I sell two or three copies of each one every month, that's a lot of money. Well, it's not a lot of money for me because I'm from California, but for somebody from ugh, Oklahoma. Or you know, Nebraska, some place like that. That's that's money. That's good. Thank you. I've I've noticed that. I've discovered that that um like those E C tub books that I do the audio of, they don't sell a lot, but they sell. And now I've got six of them done and soon be seven. And so that's a little bit from each one. That's I that makes me excited to see that and to do the math. And and you know, I've never been strong at math. But if each one of them sells three copies, three times seven is is like eighteen or something. That's a <laughs> that's pretty good. And so uh, I need to take his words to heart and just start putting them out there because I have so many stories. Tom Tancredi recently said, "You claim that you've got dozens of stories." That was in an email, although he didn't say it like. James Spader. You in didn't say it like an uh, investigator who <laughs> thinks that you're a murderer and is trying to get you to cross your words. That's right. But he said that, you know, I, I don't think he was even being doubtful. It's just the way that he phrased it. I took it as, you claim <laughs> that you were at home alone the night of the murder. But, and I was just like... Witnesses place you. I was like, Tom, I've not written dozens of stories. I've written hundreds of stories. But when you say it that way, Dean Wesley Smith would be like shaking his fist if he heard me say that. And he's like, and how many have you published? You're from California. You can do better than that. And uh, <laughs> anyhow, they, 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 they just sit uselessly on my hard drive. It's something that I need to fix. You said today, you th I don't know if it was a threat or if it was just a joke, <laughs> but you said, I'm just going to take some of your stories 
And I'm just going to put them on the ankle cast because you gave them to me and you're not ever going to publish them. And part of me was just like, don't you do Okay, you can do that kind of thing. <laughs> it was like, he's going to do some of the heavy lifting. <laughs> I think I may just do that. I do have several of your stories. And the worst part is I have even more if I was to be more organized. I'm sure if I went back through all my email, I could find dozens upon dozens of stories in there. But the ones that I've actually kept track of and uh, put into a folder, eh, maybe there's... 15, maybe 20. Well, when but we... still, I know that at least 10 of them have not been seen by anybody but me. Yeah, I see, I used to do short story collections of my stories and send them to my friends. Yeah, I, I got yeah. one of those. But when we first started the Dune Seat, the very first story by me, by Rich Outfield, that was published, as far as I know, was a story I had sent to you a couple years before, just as a, hey, this is something I wrote, Happy Halloween. Uh, it was a Christmas story, yeah. and you sent it to Norm Sherman, and I don't know how you got him to do it, but you got him uh, to blackmail record him. it for you, and that pictures. was your Christmas present to me that year, was having Norm Sherman <clears throat> record a story of, of mine, and we put it out, I'm sure it was our Christmas episode in 08, 09, something like that, 08 probably, and that story would never, ever, ever have been published anywhere. If you hadn't done that, you know what I mean? That was a disposable story, a story I wrote and will never be seen again. And there's so many like that. I don't know if anybody liked that story. What was it called? You gave it a title. I titled it, yeah, because when you sent it to me, it had no title. I think I called it Naughty or Nice. Yeah, so Naughty or Nice, I don't know if people enjoyed it. I think they probably did because um, Norm Sherman narrated it. Yeah, that that elevated the material almost to like as, as though it was from California. You know, I've got tons of stories at least that quality, and that one has been published ostensibly. <laughs> I mean, if Norm Sherman has read it, it's been published, right? There you go. Because, you know, it's just like, well, if Louis Vuitton has designed <laughs> this handbag, then we can sell it is basically what I'm thinking. Yeah, anyhow, they, these were just things that I got from the conference, and you should have been there. And it's unlikely that you'll ever be able to go. But I know that they have conferences like this all the time. And any mid-sized city has these conferences because there are people that want to write, that write any way that they write in their spare time or whatever. But more importantly, they want to be around other people that are like that, that share this. It's an obsession. It's a madness. <laughs> Not a lot of people are writers. And that's another weird thing. I would look at the people on this panel. And... They looked the same. They all had stuff in common. They all seemed like the same kind of people. And it, it made me think, well, maybe there are certain types of people who are writers. And they have certain characteristics that are similar. It's kind of like, you know, you, you go to Alabama and everybody looks the same. And that, that, that's not fair. I mean, you could have been uh, Mississippi also. But there were people, and they're a little bit introverted or a little bit awkward or whatever, and they really like words, and they like the English language, and they like story, and they like to be around other people for whom that is important. People that would say, for whom? <laughs> you know what I mean? And I just, I was like, wow, that's kind of cool. That's kind of admirable. Except for when we go to New Media Expo and around other podcasters, I'm not really around people like that. They're just like, yeah, well, that's what I want to do. Or my third novel is this, or, oh, I really struggled through this one. I ended up having to throw away a hundred pages. And, and this is what my solution was. That would bore the hell out of like my sisters or just your wife or normal right. people to hear how stories are constructed. And, and, you know, our Dune Steve show tends to be really, really writer oriented because that's what we are. And that's interesting to me. And if somebody said, well, I'm not a writer and that's not interesting. I could understand, if not forgive. <laughs> but I, I, I was like, wow, I, I should be around people like this more. I should seek out more writers and try to sleep with them. D try to, you know, mingle with them, more, go places and... More twin writers. Yeah, there's not a lot. <laughs> because, you know, they're too busy doing the things that twins do, you know, making up their own languages and passing themselves off as the other and fixing their parents' 
broken homes. <laughs> but the last thing I wanted to mention, though, and, I, and it's it, right alongside that is when the when the, the conference was over on Saturday night, people were crying and hugging and sad that it was over. And that's when I was just like, wow, I, I kind of want to I want to feel that I want to. Uh, have that in common with them. It's like, oh, shoot, well, I'm not going to see you for another year, or we're not going to be able to do this and concentrate on our writing for three days straight until next year. I don't know. I thought that was really, really neat. And I, I know that, like, Abby Hilton would talk about what Balticon is like or, or Dragon Con, and you see these people that you only see at that convention, but you're, like, really, really close friends for the three or four days that you see them. And then, you know, you know, the rest of the time, it's just going to be Skype or telephone or, or email or texting. But this is the one time you have to be around them. I, I That is really cool. And I did feel that, although I don't remember crying much, uh, when we went to New Media Expo last year and when we went the year before. You don't remember crying much, but I remember you crying a ton. Gosh, it was like the whole first three hours of the drive home. Well, there was that Rachel Doherty girl. <laughs> we, but that's the thing. We we all went out and we did karaoke or whatever. And I was just like, these are my friends. These people, these people at the table are my friends. And I don't know. I I had missed that. I thought that, that was really neat. All of my friends from before got married and had a buttload of kids. And once that happens, they don't get to be my friend anymore. But because the beast doesn't like children. <laughs> And uh, neither do you. And so, no, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a good follower of, of Lord Satan. He, I mean, he, come on. I don't want to disappoint him. Uh, and so it was just really neat to uh, to be in that environment with people like that, that, that I admire and like. And uh, anyhow, I would like to be somebody like that. I feel like I've been on a soapbox a <laughs> lot in this episode. <laughs> There's been times where I've tried to get a word in edgewise, but mostly I've been unsuccessful. So well, I'm sorry. You really you were on a soapbox uh, sometimes. You know, there was a few things that I got out of your recordings that uh, I don't know that we've mentioned yet. Some things that I'd like to try. One thing, there was a panel about characters and developing characters. And one guy mentioned that what he did, what he liked to do, was when he was developing his characters, he would write like a two-page introduction and it, he would write it in first person of this character and he would write it in their voice, you know, so if they talked a certain way or if they did certain... He would even like have the character lie about themselves in the bio about themselves and then he said he'd keep notes at the end like okay he was actually lying when he said this and this and this and this so that when he went back i guess he wouldn't be like oh oh crap i, I didn't know this is what he did <laughs> have to go and change things or something but he said that he would use that sometimes when he was you know he hadn't written that character for a while or uh, whatever, he could go back and read that two-page thing, and then he'd be right into that character's voice, and he could just jump right in and start writing what that character uh, would say or would do and and so forth. And I thought that was a really interesting thing. That's something I would like to try. Maybe when I write a novel in 90 days, I'll do that. Well, he said that it was helpful for him anytime that character would show up. He could just scam, scam? He could scan through that piece of paper... And suddenly he was in that mindset again. He was yeah. that character. And it would be all the easier to have that character's words flow or, you know, the, the way that he talked or his, his own mindset of, you know, the way he saw the world. Yeah, and that, that seems like a really good idea. The other thing that I remember is there was a panel about, I want to say it was about criticism or handling criticism or something like that, where they were talking about writers' groups Mm -hmm. and first readers and that kind of stuff. And I realized that that's something that I need to get. I need people who will be first readers for me. I'm thinking, I think that before this episode comes out, because this is our first episode in months, I think I'll put a post out on Facebook just to see if there's anybody who's interested who would like to be a first reader for me. Because I think that's something that I need to do, something that would make my stuff better. 
to get a few opinions. And, you know, they talked about, you know, you, you take what everybody says and, you know, you take it all with a grain of salt. You don't have to do everything they say. If they say, oh, this needs to be like this, well, if you disagree, then you disagree. What you really want to do is take a consensus. You know, if everybody is saying, yeah, this is bad, then that's something you need to change. But if only one person or two people say it, eh, maybe it's just a, a thing that can go either way. And some people go for it and other people don't. But yeah, those are a couple of things that I took from some of the panels. I, I have to admit, I had a harder time because, you know, you record. I think you recorded them with this same device we're recording the show on now, except for it was in a big room and the person was speaking over a microphone and you were just picking up whatever would come through. And I would hear all the people in the audience giggle and chuckle and sometimes there'd be somebody nearby that would man 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 would say something yeah and um other times you would be like oh nice which <laughs> i always thought was fun <laughs> whenever uh, out of the blue rish outfield would appear. oh because i'm super loud but, right well yeah because you're right next to it so you would come through clear uh there was one where i couldn't hear a thing i i, I was yeah just like, the the bain universe uh, the the keynote address one, I think it was, where I was just like, yeah, I it's can't the, tell a most word. of the time I'd try and sit right at the front or in the second row or whatever, and in this case, you know, it was a big auditorium and I was way back, and uh, yeah, I, I heard it before I put it in the Dropbox for you, and I was like, oh, yeah, I started playing that one, I was like, uh, and that, at, before like a minute was up, I was just like, okay, I'm gonna have to give up on this one. But all in all, I was really glad that you recorded them for me and I had the opportunity to listen to them. Yeah, you know, another cool thing, like you had mentioned, kind of passingly, we talked to an author at the show. He was at both the convention and the conference. And yeah, we talked to him and we're going to do a story of his on uh, the podcast coming up. That's cool, I think. That's that's something that's fun and, and really positive to be able to do something like that. And it's probably an author that you've heard the name of, I'm guessing, before. Which is also fun. I, I always like to get something that will appeal to a wider group of people than, you know, some of our stuff is just more, you know, you've never heard of the guy before, but hopefully the story's good or whatever. But, yeah, in this case, you'll probably know the guy already before... You even start listening to the story, which is neat. And only California Rish could walk up to a guy like that and just be like, yeah, I do this show and we sh you want, you need to have your story on our show. We have thousands of listeners, thousands more than any anybody's ever read your book. So <laughs> you... <laughs> but see, you would need that kind of mindset to go up to people and, and just say, you know, I need a short story for nothing, you know. Uh, I know there are people that do that. Marshall Latham is not from California, and yet he has gotten books from people, stories from people, rather, um, because he has ambition. He, another thing that BFE Rush Outfield doesn't have. Uh, I find it admirable that people can just do that, and I need to do it more. Um, and, and you know what would be really neat is if he's blown away and he says, wow, here's another one. In the same way that, that, Mike, that we've established a friendship with Mike Resnick. Yeah, talk about that. The other day you were reading a Star Trek book that mentioned Mike Resnick's name as having written a spec script for the Star Trek uh, series. And you just hopped on, sent him an email and asked him about it. And he immediately wrote you back and said, oh, yeah. He said he hadn't thought about that in 40 years. <laughs> and I just thought that was really interesting. And it's cool to be able to do that. This is, And I guess these days you could do that with a lot of people because there's Facebook and, you know, you, you can just get on an author's Facebook page or whatever and they're on the other end of it. They'll respond. It's not like the old days where you, you know, you like a plant, you cast your seed into the wind, <laughs> you sent them a, a letter, and maybe they might spend the, you know, 30 cents or whatever it costs to, to mail you back a, a reply and spend all the time that it took. But yeah, now it's it doesn't require any time to write a sentence or two and say, oh, yeah, yeah, this and that. There you go. And on Facebook, it's even less. You just 
you just throw in something and that's a I guess a really cool aspect of you know this day and age but yeah we actually have that relationship oh yeah we're the guys that did all those shows with the catastrophe baker well the princess of mars no Prin that's what was princess of earth was what it was called right princess of mars is the one that they were kind of he was riffing on with it well you had just said you know you're going to put it out on facebook do people want to uh be a first reader for you and, and I have made a couple of friends through podcasting where I can send them my stories and say give me notes on them I, I think that that's neat and there have been people who have asked me to do that and so we'll have to keep doing that it's probably always smart to have a couple other people read your thing especially if you're planning on self-publishing um, yeah you need to get as many eyes on it as possible to make sure that you haven't done something really dumb or even something not all that dumb, but still would be better if it was fixed. It's little things that you don't think about or you don't realize. And sometimes, you know, just certain people know things and you don't know it. So you fudge your way through it or whatever. But they're just like, oh, you know what? No, this is what it really is. And then you don't have to fudge your way through it. You can just do it right. So, the, yeah, that's cool. And uh, definitely something that uh, I took from the panels that I heard and something that I want to improve. I'm thinking that maybe come June, maybe June 1st through the summer will be our 90 days to write a novel. If you think that uh, might work for you, I don't know. We'll have to talk about the timing of it. But I was thinking that would be best once all the sweeps are over and there won't be another sweeps until November comes. I think that would work best for me. Be the most likely to have success. Well, yeah, tentatively, that's the thing to do. But we are definitely saying 2015 is the year of the novel, though. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I am willing to try. Uh, and if, if you have somebody else that's doing it at the same time, it's probably easier. Um, just to, to say, oh, hey, I got 3,000 words today. I wrote, you know, from dawn until noon. And you're like, shoot, I only wrote four words today. Two of them were racial slurs. <laughs> I, I don't know. So, I, yeah, I think so. I mean, by the time this episode airs, hopefully we'll have figured out exactly when we're going to do this. But we are going to do it. And I could talk a lot more about, you know, my friends that have written novels and how easy they make it sound. or, But I'm not going to. You know, everybody's got their own yardstick by which they measure themselves by which they spank twins. And so this will just be our yardstick, though, if, if we can do this, if we can write a novel in 2015. All right. Uh, sounds like we're coming to the end. It's starting to get really cold in here, too. I think it's probably time we need to uh, at least turn the car on and get the heater going again. So we're going to need to stop recording. But thanks for listening, everybody. And, uh, you know, hold us to this stuff. If we've talked about stuff in here and you haven't seen it come to pass, you know, ask us about it. We're on Facebook. You can just send us a little e a little thing. And like I said, it's so easy to respond back. You can just... And, and you responded. It's that easy. That's really what Mark Zuckerberg had in mind was the... <laughs> <laughs> so hold us to it. If there's something you heard and you want to hear about, for example, Birth of a Sidekick that California Rish is writing, his sequel to a sidekick, you know, keep him to it. He says he's struggling, so he needs somebody to hold his feet to the fire so that he keeps working on it and finishes. And you know what might even work? Pledge to purchase the finished story from him, and then he'll really, because he'll be like, what? Money? I'm from California. I love money. That's right. Um, so... <laughs> That was since the gold rush. We created money. So, yeah, you, uh, you hold us to it. We'd re it would really help us out, I think. And uh, that's uh, our show for today. I'm Big Anklovich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And I'm not from California. Uh, I hope you like us anyway. I'm Big Anklovich, and I am from California, so you must like me. It is the law. <laughs> Good night. See ya.
That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons non-commercial 3.0 license. You've got to be kidding me.